allow me to introduce our panelists that are here seated uh, with me. And I will allow them to just, first of all, start off with uh, um, their own overview or their own reflections, 30 years since the 1994 genocide against the Tutsis, and how such a forum can be able to instill a level of accountability, but also trying to understand and reflecting uh, on that. I want to start off with uh, uh, Dr. Fred Golova Mutevi, who is on my far left. He is a research coordinator and associate analyst at Never Again Rwanda. He's done a lot of research extensively, and he's also uh, from Rwanda. So I want to understand from you, um, Dr. Fred. Rwanda today, we've seen in publications, we witness the rankings of the country, um, best place to be born a woman, um, fastest among the fastest growing economies, cleanest city uh, in Africa. And I'll add that it's a country where you'll keep your phone the longest. I am I, I'm a witness. I have a lot of old phones bundled up in a drawer. But there's something, there's work that has been done to actually get to this level. I wanted to start off with that reflection and try to tell us what your thought process is on that journey, um, and then we'll be able to continue uh, on that note. Yeah, um, thank you very much, uh, Eugene. <coughs> and um, yeah, I'd like to thank our audience for turning up to remember uh, 30 years on. Um, my reflection is very simple. <coughs> Some people usually talk about post-genocide Rwanda as some kind of miracle. What has happened in Rwanda is a miracle. It's not a miracle. What has happened in Rwanda is the outcome of deliberate efforts by the people who lead that country, who have led that country over the last 30 years to make it what it is. <clears throat> now, I would like to talk about this whole idea of never again. Some people think that never again is about there not being another genocide in Rwanda. I think it's more than that. Never again is about making sure that the conditions that led to the genocide in Rwanda do not uh, come back again or are not allowed to emerge. Now, what is it about Rwanda that I personally find um, profound? <clears throat> uh, what, I find about prof what I find profound about Rwanda is what is usually most neglected about that country. And that is how Rwanda has managed after the genocide to rebuild so quickly to remain stable and to remain peaceful. How that how has that happened? Now, I am a political scientist, and I'm very much interested in politics. And one of the things that I keep hearing about Rwanda is how there is no democracy in Rwanda, there is no opposition in Rwanda. And I always ask people, what do you mean when you say these things? Now, for me, uh, the profound thing about Rwanda is the political or other political arrangements that were put in place after the genocide. Because today's Rwanda politically doesn't work like pre-genocide Rwanda. In that when people say Rwanda is not a democracy, I always say, no, Rwanda is a democracy. But Rwanda is not a conventional liberal democracy. Rwanda is a democracy of a different kind. But what, what's interesting about politics in Rwanda is that after the genocide, the people who took over the country decided to not allow themselves to be carried away by this idea of competitive politics, as we know it elsewhere in Africa. But Rwanda has had a government of national unity since the end of the genocide. Rwanda has a consensus building political system. And it is in that rejection of conventional political contestations, or what we call adversarial contestations, that we find the answer for Rwanda's continued stability and for the government not being deflected from what it should do in terms of rebuilding the country 
but being allowed to focus on the important things that happen or that should happen. If you see clean Kigali, if you see the countryside uh, looking the way it does, if you see that there are very few political controversies in the country, if you see that there is no corruption in the country or there is very little corruption in the country, it, go, it all goes back to what I think is the foundation. The foundation is consensus building. We have 11 political parties in the country. Now, this is not very well known by a lot of people who comment on Rwanda. They think Rwanda is a one-party state, and I read this and I hear it repeated many times. Rwanda is not a one-party state. Rwanda is a multi-party democracy, but not the way we conceive of democracies in, in Africa. Of the 11 political parties in the country, nine are in government. Only two are not, and the two which are not are the smallest political parties. But then we have something called the National Forum of Political Organizations, where the two political parties that are not represented in parliament meet with those, uh, sorry, that are not represented in the cabinet, meet with those that are in government to talk about the most important things about the country. This is where the most potentially controversial issues are discussed and fleshed out and then they go to parliament. So Rwanda has a unique political system that has allowed for the stability that we see today. Now if you look at Rwanda's neighbors or some of them with our politics, and I, I should remind you, or for those who don't know, I'm originally Ugandan. I come from one of the most vibrant democracies. The problem with democracy, the way we conceive of it, is that every, every time we have elections or democratic elections, what happens is that we fight. We beat each other up, we break each other's limbs, crack each other's skulls, uh, the uh, security forces are deployed. Election campaigns look like war. And I always ask people, what is so good about this? Now, in my opinion, what I see in Rwanda, because in Rwanda we have very short election campaigns, one month. No violence, no insults, no fighting. And after that one month we have elections, and the following day after the elections you can, even had, you can hardly tell there has been an election in the country. You can hardly tell there has been a campaign. So for me, it's those things about Rwanda that explain everything else that we see and which I always wish other countries in Africa could look at and possibly emulate, if they could. Thanks. Wonderful. Uh, we'll come back to you, Dr. Fred. Um, Prof, I, I want to just give you another chance to just probe some of the statements you mentioned earlier on, and also picking from what Dr. Fred says. And I would like us to probe this notion that if there is no confrontational politics, then there is no democracy. I hear a lot of that, and I want, because you've been in and out of Rwanda many times, you've observed the country. What sort of lessons can we learn from that model? We are not saying one size fits all is what we need to do, but what sort of lessons can all of us learn from that sort of a model of democracy? Thank you very much. Let me pick up the words you've used. There is no one size fits all democracy. I hold the view that each society's system of governance must be informed by her realities. And, and I want to remind us that when we talk about democracy, even here in Africa, we use foreign tongues. We are speaking in English, therefore we say democracy. Some will be speaking in French. Some, I always ask people in Africa, in your mother tongue, what is the word for democracy? And I'm much more comfortable with the word governance. How do you govern yourselves? And the post-colonial African state finds itself sometimes in a very difficult position because you are a multi-nation state. You go to a country and you find different nations which historically had different governance systems. But we have chosen after 1963 to make good of what we have. We have a lemon, we make ourselves lemonade, if you allow me that analogy. So what do we do? 
you allow your specific circumstances to define how you are going to govern yourselves and to make sure that the governance system you use is acceptable to the critical majority of the people. Will it be perfect? No. Perfection is a goal that we aim at, never achieve. And I believe that the history of uh, post-genocide Rwanda after 1994, so far, is good. And, and, and I use the word so far. Let us not imagine that things have been solved for all times. There are forces within and without Rwanda that would want to disturb the calm that is there. And we must be eternally vigilant to ensure that those forces are not given the oxygen to thrive. Being aware of that, it is also important to embrace systems that try to include. And in the case of Rwanda, one of the things that I think can inform governance itself is how Gashasha was used. Look at the tribunal in Rwanda, which was based in Arusha. If we had been following that model, how many people would have been tried? And even if you convicted people, how would you have restored calm in the society? But when the society took the view and went back to the history of Rwanda and said, we have a system. This system says that if you committed a crime and you come out and admit that crime, you who are the perpetrator of the crime, we will rehabilitate you. If we could use that and deploy it in the manner in which we organize our affairs, then I think we can solve many problems. Easier said than done. But I hold the view that it is important to learn those lessons and always to remind us that even when there is good, evil is alive and well seeking to destroy the good. So our guards must be up and our guards must remain up. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Dr. Lonzen, we've had engagements with you on the platform, uh, the summit, and, and you've also been very active even as the managing editor for the Pan-African Review magazine and online media platform. You've written extensively about the democracy model uh, in Rwanda, but as you give us your thought process, what's running in your mind, I want us to also reflect back in the journey of building that system 30 years later. Uh, uh, Prof. Bielo says it's not a one-size-fits-all. All of us have different and unique uh, systems. But sometimes, like he said, there are forces that sometimes want to impose, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, a one-size-fits-all standard, especially for democracy. Talk to us a bit what's running on your mind right now 30 years later. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Anangwe. Um, so, if adversarial politics set the context for genocide, it would be irrational to continue adversarial politics in the post-genocide setting. So, it is only makes sense that the nature of politics would have to shift from what was a key factor in the setting of the genocide. Therefore, uh, Actually, this was part of the constitutional making process in Rwanda. Uh, in the constitutional making pro process, uh, when uh, during the, the consultations, when the consultations were, were taken to the people and the word was used for uh, political parties, the people did not want this. They said we don't want political parties because they understood political parties with ad adversarial uh, uh, interactions. Because they said those people are the ones who brought us problems. We, we killed each other because they told us to kill and it started with them, those parties. Yeah? So they don't want political parties. So it was taken back. Uh, redrafting. The question was set up differently. They said uh, political organizations. They said, okay, po the political organizations, they work together. Oh, that is fine. That is okay. It's okay. So, so <laughs> the, 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 the wor working together to solve problems or find solutions for the country, in the constitutional making process, the people of Rwanda approved that. 
but they did not want political parties because they, in their mind, they, these are contentional uh, adversarial entities that are there to incite them to, cause, to, do, to, to, to do bad. So, um, now, the interesting part uh, also about post-genocide Rwanda is that those who seek to promote democracy in Rwanda, they identify with adversarial politics because that is the kind of politics they practice in their homes. So they want to export that politics in Rwanda because it's the only form of politics they accept is democracy. Anything that is not like what they practice at home is illegitimate to them. Therefore, anybody that naturally, in their view, makes the Rwandan political system illegitimate because it does not look like theirs, because it is not adversarial like the, the kind they practice at home. And if the political system is illegitimate, that means they cannot support it. That means anybody who is fighting that political system will be supported. They will support anyone ready to fight uh, that political system that they conceive to be illegitimate. Now, especially as a, as a, uh, naturally speaking, the, the party that is likely to fight that kind of politics is likely to be the kind of party that seeks to bring back the adversarial politics that cause problems. So those who seek to promote politics, uh, democracy in Rwanda tend to align with forces that seek to bring back the kind of politics that cause problems in the first place. Right. Yes. While you still have the mic, there's been that notion then, going by what you said and what we've heard from the previous two speakers, that that kind of model stifles voices of dissent and also does not allow for new candidates. For example, uh, we are heading to an election and President Paul Kagame has accepted the nomination to be the flag bearer again. And, and that is causing jitters in some corners. And the argument is, you've overstayed. And, and I want you to just school us a bit on, on, on that notion and what misconception has been there that you'd want to correct today. Uh, well, again, uh, freedom of speech must be in context. In this case, if you're talking about politics and political parties, the objective of, of politics must be to must be constructive, just like the people in the in the constitution making process articulated. So, if freedom is destructive, then at there's nowhere in the world in which that kind of freedom is acceptable. Therefore, uh, if you are talking about uh, freedom of speech, to what objective is that freedom of speech? Uh, is it to incite people to, to do genocide? Is, is it to introduce the kind of politics that uh, brings back confrontation in a kind of society that is recovering from this kind of, uh, of, of, of tragedy in whose memories are still fresh about the causes of, of the, 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 the experience they, they suffered? So the, the, the the definition of speech must be relevant to the experiences that people face or went through. Right. All right. I'll come back to prove that even more. I want to hear from um, a lady who I want us to applaud because she made it officially a panel and not a manel. When I say manel is all men, but she officially makes this a panel. Let's appreciate a charity Kagwi Ndongo for giving us officially a panel. <laughs> Thank you, Charity. Charity, you are the current head of anti-corruption, uh, crime prevention, and criminal justice program at the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime Regional Office for Eastern Africa here in Nairobi, but you are also a prosecutor for the ICTR. And in uh, the opening remarks and also in his uh, uh, you know, uh, introductory remarks on this panel, Prof has hailed Gachacha, uh, and, and ICTR does not, or there are no good words for lack of a better word, in terms of the work that it did, um, in terms of 
bringing justice to the victims and survivors of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsis. I give you a chance to talk to us today. What think has been the contribution of ICTR in the Rwanda we see today 30 years later? Um, thank you. And uh, may I first say that um, ICTR was formed to, hold, to, to basically hold those who are most responsible for the genocide. That meant the top uh, cadre. That's why we had the prime minister who was tried, all the leaders who are like very, uh, like, were seen as really leading during that time. Um, what I do think uh, that could have been done better was there should have been a much more consultative process when they decide, when the world community, the international community stood up and recognized this is a genocide. A genocide requires a global response. But it's been 30 years. What lessons, what are the untold stories you can whisper to us today? And just tell us that these are the things that stopped us and today we've learned X, Y, Z. Because Prof said con uh, conventions and treaties are not enough. And, and here you say there was that convention that was born, but we still continue to see these atrocities. When we say never again genocide, do we really mean it? What, what, what's the missing link that would make us walk the talk? I think uh, what Prof said is people quickly forget uh, history. History is all those one million lives that were lost in such a horrible fashion. In fact, I remember people were saying all the demons have left hell and they've gone to Rwanda. People forget the pain, the type of genocide this was um, with crude, crude, um, crude uh, instruments. Uh, and in such a fast fashion, people forget. And I think that's the saddest thing because we should not forget. The blood was not shed in vain. If one of the books that we used to read at that time was part of the genocide story, was they wanted to kill everybody so that nobody could tell the story. Yeah, and that the story would be forgotten. We have to make a commitment that we won't forget the pain, the anguish, uh, of being raped, yeah. someone's father, someone's sister, someone's wife, children, and we forget, and I think that's the problem, or we think it would not happen to us. And that was my problem. Coming from Kenya, yeah. uh, I thought, no, um, in Rwanda, there could be a genocide because there are two tribes, so one tribe can turn against the other, mm -hmm. but in Kenya we are 42 or 43. How is it possible to have a genocide in this country? Yeah. And then we saw the signs. Then we saw the signs it can happen anywhere. Yeah. And what was so terrifying was that you didn't think you could be a victim or one of the victim groups. And it suddenly looks the story could happen at any time, at any place. Humanity is able to go down that path again yeah. unless we always remember. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, Dr. Fred. I'd like to read your thoughts, uh, picking up from the aspect of access to justice. And I want us to talk a bit about international justice and its role, because up to today, despite all the signs of growth, transformation, even within the justice system of Rwanda, there are still countries that continue to harbor these genocides. And some of them are arrested in those countries, but they refuse to repatriate them back to Rwanda to face justice. What's the claim? They will, not be, they will not access fair trial. I mean, it seems Rwanda needs to validate itself to show that we can do it. Uh, read or tell us what you feel, especially on that aspect of access to justice. 30 years later, we have victims, we have survivors who are still yearning for justice. We've talked about Kabuga, who could probably be released because of the claims that he can't stand trial. I want to read your thoughts. When you listen to survivors, what are you hearing from them on this aspect of international justice? Um, it's quite clear that in Rwanda there is a fairly significant degree of dissatisfaction with so-called international justice. Now, I'm not sure in what sense we should be referring to whatever we are talking about as international justice. Because what has happened in terms of how the world views Rwanda or Rwanda's institutions 
has to do with how Rwanda is reported about in media. International media seem to have a knack for, and I'm not sure if this is deliberate, but I think that they do have this idea that they know everything and they project what they know onto the world. And it's usually what they know that we also get to know and believe to be true. Um, the refusal by some jurisdictions to return uh, genocide perpetrators to Rwanda has to do with this idea that somehow the ju judiciary in Rwanda is not independent. Now, those of us who live in the country know that this is not true. But also we know that there are jurisdictions that have gone beyond this um, idea and actually returned um, genocide uh, or alleged genocide perpetrators to Rwanda. Canada has done it, the United States has done it. The Scandinavian countries have been much more willing than others to return these people to Rwanda. And as far as we know, the evidence that we see is that when they have been committed to trial, these trials have uh, satisfied what uh, people may refer to as international standards. So I think that alongside the general dissatisfaction with uh, um, international justice is this ever-present idea inside Rwanda that Rwanda is misrepresented in many ways. Now I can give you one of the mo most annoying but current examples is this argument about whether uh, Britain should send um, um, are they refugees, asylum, asylum seekers, seekers to Rwanda for processing before a decision is made um, about what sh should happen to them. Now those who are opposing this in Britain keep saying, oh you know, Rwanda is not a democracy and these people's rights are not going to be respected and so on and so forth. But actually what people do not seem to take uh, into account is that Britain suggested this to Rwanda after Rwanda had actually been doing this for years by itself. When President Kagame became the chairman of the AU, he decided that African refugees who were being mistreated in Libya, who were being sold as slaves and so on and so forth, could be relocated from Libya and taken to other places where they would find safety. Now he proposed this as something that could be taken up by different countries, but no country stepped up to do it. Now Rwanda started evacuating African uh, refugees from Libya. There were Ethiopians, Eritreans, Sudanese, different nationalities, and bringing them to Rwanda, housing them, feeding them, and keeping them in Rwanda pending their processing for relocation to third countries. Now this wasn't funded by any foreign government, although the UNHCR was helping. A lot of these people that came to Rwanda under this program left Rwanda, went to Canada, went to various places, others went to Uganda, and, and, but no one has actually accused Rwanda of having violated their rights. It's only until Britain saw what Rwanda was doing successfully on its own and suggested they could also actually handle their asylum seekers from Rwanda. And now this whole thing of, you know, these people, Rwanda is not safe for refugees, Rwanda is not safe for asylum seekers, and so on and so forth. That's one example. In Rwanda, we have a school of girls from Afghanistan. An entire school was relocated from Afghanistan and brought to Rwanda. Now these young girls from Afghanistan and all their teachers have been living in Rwanda for years. God knows whether they will go back to Afghanistan or move on to another country, but they're living in Rwanda and they're safe. But every time I look at British media, the people in Britain who are who the government suggests should be brought to Rwanda are now being seen as hapless victims. These are going to be victims of suppression and blah, 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 blah. We have a, a full medical school from Sudan, which has been relocated to Rwanda. 
dozens of Sudanese young medical students are now leaving and studying in Rwanda. The whole school was evacuated to Rwanda. No one is telling us that these people are being suppressed or oppressed or their rights are being violated. So it's, it's this mis continuous misreporting by these pompous Western uh, journalists who are ignorant of what happens in the country that now informs international public opinion about Rwanda. But the facts are there and anyone can see them. Now, let me just go back to a little bit to uh, the question you raised to Lonzen about um, there being no room for dissent in Rwanda. I mentioned the National Forum of Political Organizations. Now, as I said before, post-genocide Rwanda is very nervous about recreating the conditions that led to the genocide. And one of the conditions was this endless dissenting. Dissenting in the streets, people fighting in the streets, parties fighting, transferring these conflicts into the communities. So post-genocide Rwanda is very nervous about recreating those conditions. This is the basis for the creation of the National Forum of Political Organizations. So that political organizations that are not in parliament can meet with their uh, counterparts in the forum and deal with those matters that could otherwise create uh, the kind of dissent that exporters of conventional multi-party politics want to see in each and every country. So the National Forum of Political Organizations is a space for political parties to dissent and to argue among themselves. And just to go a little bit into the details, the in the National Forum of Political Organizations, however large a party is, however small it is, each party is represented by four people. Decision making in this forum is by absolute consensus. Where one could say there is no space for dissent, there's actually a lot of space for discussion. You must know about the, um, uh, the National Dialogue Council. Yes. Well, this is, this is a meeting that happens every year in Rwanda, bringing together all the leaders in the country in their different categories. Now, you will have a few hundred people sitting in a room in Kigali. This meeting is being broadcast live on radio. It is broadcast live on TV. It is being streamed on the internet. So Rwandans inside the country and Rwandans, Rwandans outside the country can actually participate in this meeting. Rwandans in Kigali, Rwandans outside, outside Kigali can participate in this meeting. The president is there, ministers are there, governors are there, security chiefs are there. Rwandans can phone in and complain about all kinds of things. Now when somebody says there's no room for dissent in Rwanda, do they know that there is such a thing as a national dialogue council? Do they know about the National Forum of Political Organizations? Do they know about all these different forums across the entire country where people are now saying, guys, we are tired of taking part in these endless discussions? Right. Thanks. Uh, Prof, the question of narrative creation, and going by what Dr. Fred says, it seems from his own words um, that international media seems to have um, you know, taking over and shaping that narrative, and it seems that is what now is believed out here. I want to ask you a question on your own assessment, because we have media on the continent, the African media in telling the African story. All these are beautiful things happening in, in Rwanda. And I want to hear your thoughts on either a failure or a lack of interest. What would you prescribe to the Pan-African media, eh, quote unquote? Let me preface my response by saying that in Africa, we have now turned the art of complaining into a science, and we must stop that. We must tell our story and invest in telling that story. We don't, so that we are as it were, wedded to what we call international media, to BBC, France, Al Jazeera, and all these. And we can keep on complaining until the cows come home, and they will not. So the time is now for us to have media that tells our story, because that is what we want the world to know about us. Are we investing in that? We are not. 
And sometimes we don't have the budget to support that. But if we look at some of these things regionally, for example, mm. within the context of East African community and within the context of the African Union, and we are able to tell our stories, even to articulate our understanding of governance as being specific to our circumstances, then people will begin to consume that story. Yeah. We don't. So I think the time has come that we must stop agonizing and begin organizing. We must not have media which is involved, which thinks that news is importing domestic squabbles and little disagreements amongst politicians. We must stop that and begin to engage in a proper manner. I, I, I watch news in diff about Africa in different media and, and you can see that people invest. In this thing, you have somebody, whether you like them or not, in Al Jazeera. He's actually based in Kigali. But take any typical African media. They'll be in Nairobi and reporting about an event in Rabat, Morocco. <laughs> they don't know what is happening. They're just listening to other media. And then they pick it up and present it as their own. I think, in conclusion, the time is now. Tell our story tell it in a manner that is believable. Let us have uh, the story backed with verifiable evidence. And in the fullness of time, people will begin to understand and embrace our story because it is evidence-based and verifiable. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Dr. Lonson, you're in the media space, the Pan-African Review publication. Guilty as charged? Uh, <laughs> we are trying to... Uh, start to steer the ship in the different direction. Uh -huh. Golova said that uh, these people who killed, they ran away and they're in the western capitals and they are not facing justice. And those countries are not sending them to Rwanda because they claim Rwanda's justice is impartial. They won't get a fair, he fair hearing. Fair enough. But they are required prosecute them where they are. If their justice is so fair and so good, why don't they prosecute them there? So it means that if they are refusing to send them to Rwanda and refusing to prosecute them where they are, it means that they are facilitating the evasion of justice. So they are complicit in the crimes of, the, of, of these people. Uh, now, even worse, the, the, these people who are evading justice in that manner they rebrand themselves as political opponents of Rwanda. And because their politics serves the, the objective where these who seek to promote politics in Rwanda consider the politics inside Rwanda illegitimate because it does not look like their own, are able to align with these rebranded killers who now call themselves politicians yeah. who seek to bring back in Rwanda adversarial politics. Yeah. Therefore, they become partners. Yeah. That alliance of killers and the Western, uh, Western uh, authorities yeah. is, exists. So uh, the, the third point, the last point I want to make on the question is why Kagame keeps running. I don't want to speak for him, but I think I have uh, an idea of why he keeps running. Mm -hmm. The, the post-genocide politics in Rwanda set the standard for leadership so high uh, that, uh, you see, the, 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 the nature of the challenges uh, and the threat that uh, exist, they naturally set the standard for leadership uh, so high. Now, uh, it's not a matter of simply replacing Kagame. Mm -hmm. If it was a matter of replacing him, he would have been replaced so long ago. So it's a matter of meeting the standards that have been set. Mm -hmm. So, And the argument is what is being done to allow others to meet those standards. And the question is who should be doing that? Uh -huh. Who yeah. should be? Yeah. You tell me. Yeah, so um, Kagame or the RPF is not, does not exist as a political party to nurture their replacement. Mm -hmm. That's not how politics works. Mm -hmm. It should not look go in the opposition 
to, 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 to raise leaders to the standards that meet the expectations but of Rwandans. You show us your successor. I'm of, the, of course, no one believes that Kagame is immortal, that he'll be there forever. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, once you, you, you address the challenge mm -hmm. of Kagame's immortality on the one hand, yeah. you also address the challenge of the standards. Mm -hmm. And as long as Kagame remains alive mm -hmm. and uh, capable mm -hmm. and uh, willing to serve, yeah. In the view of those who see that the, 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 the objective is the standard, yeah. not the replacement, yeah. he will continue to run. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. when someone within the RPF, because the RPF is not there to groom opposition, mm -hmm. someone within the RPF meets the standards set, or they may not be, maybe to the standard Kagame has set, but at a standard that is acceptable given the circumstances and challenges Rwanda faces. Right. Therefore, as long as the objective will not be to merely replace Kagame, mm -hmm. and as long as a replacement of Kagame within the party who meets a certain threshold of the standard yeah. has not emerged, Kagame will continue to run. And it would be irresponsible of him to not continue running if they have not been able to meet the threshold of the standard required to lead post-genocide Rwanda. Right. Uh, Dr. Fred, you want to intervene, but then I'll come back to uh, charity. In 2000, between 2013 and 2017, when the country was discussing whether President Kagame should stay on after the expiry of his uh, second term, there was a lot of discussion across the country. <coughs> and I having done research in Rwanda for as long as I have done and having the kind of access that I've developed over time, I, I spent a great deal of time speaking to prominent Rwandans about this, both members of the RPF, but also members of the other political parties. I think the obsession with whether Kagame should step down or not sidesteps an important question. Do Rwandans want him to step down if they do, which Rwandans? Do Rwandans want him to continue if they do, which Rwandans? Now we all know that there, there is no country where decisions of, these kinds, of this kind are made outside of the broad political elite. Now as I said, there are 11 political parties in the country. What was the view of these parties when this question came up? From my own understanding and from my interaction with various party leaders, the view was that he's the best choice we have for now. And therefore we, as Rwandans, we will make the decision as to whether he stays or not. Now outsiders can criticize us, but this is our country, so we decide. And I addressed this matter with various political leaders and they were telling me the same thing. Earlier before that, I had been speaking to some people who were adamant that he would retire. He wasn't the kind of person who would stay on after two terms. Mm -hmm. By 2014, they had changed their minds for all kinds of reasons that I'm not going to go into. Now, again, we see him standing, or we see he's poised to stand in the next few weeks. Now, something happened last week that struck me, and many people may have missed it that immediately he accepted to stand again. The second largest party, the Social Democratic Party, immediately declared their support for him, and they said they are not going to present a candidate. Now this is the second largest party. The RPF, President Kagame's party, the RPF, is the largest party. The second largest party declared almost immediately that they will not be sponsoring a candidate, they are going to present to support President Kagame's candidacy. The third largest political party, the Liberal Party, did the same. Now, but also the RPF is in official coalition with five other parties. So there is a six party coalition that supports the RPF. Now those six, including the RPF plus the Social Democratic Party and the Liberal Party, you now have eight out of eleven parties having declared they are supporting his candidacy. Right. Now, I assume that these parties reflect the opinions of their members, in which case one can argue that the vast majority of Rwandans yeah. 
support the idea that he should continue. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? My response is always, it's up to Rwandans. It's, it's their country. Right. It's their decision. And Charity, um, the last time we spoke, there was this conversation around whether there's a thin line or the line is very clear between uh, hate speech and freedom of press. You did participate in all the media hearings, and we know the role the media played in the uh, 1994 genocide against the Tutsis. And I want to hear your thoughts in terms of the building blocks that since 30 years later that have been put in place to ensure that there's a clear line, clear understanding that, hey, this is hate speech. It is not freedom of, 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 of expression. We know of a leader within the region who actually outrightly declared war on a fellow country. Are there any jurisprudence or any guiding legal processes that clearly indicate this is hate speech and it has these consequences because we know the role that media can play in that sense? When uh, people have the microphone like I do, they have a responsibility that you have to your neighbor. No right is uh, is is completely um, no, no right does not have duties. A right has to have a duty. Your right to to speak also starts where my your my your right my duty your duty to me for safety. So when you start talking, for example, against a certain ethnic group, yeah. and I'll tell you, for example, we all maybe people might not know. We, I see very many young people. But right from 1990, uh, the, was it around the early 90s, the magazine, which was a little tabloid magazine um, called Kangura, not a big magazine or big newspaper like um, Nation or Standard, it was a small tabloid, yeah. but it was widely read. It would, I would actually say today it would be like TikTok, people reading on TikTok, people watching on, you know, sending messages to each other on WhatsApp. But... It called itself the Kangura, which meant awake. And it was supposed to awake, awaken the Hutu yeah. uh, conscience. And then it started targeting. And I think for me it was a big deal because the first target was the Tutsi women. They were said whether the Tutsi woman is your wife or your mother, you have to be very careful, or, or your concubine or your employee, be careful because she's working with her brothers outside. She's never loyal. They talked about people with businesses. Um, they don't join this particular. These people are never trustworthy. If, guys, if you, can, if you listen to some of these lines, you can't trust these people with business. They will always cheat you. So you must, as a Hutu, not have business dealings with Tutsi. Yeah. So slowly, they start isolating the group. Everybody wonders, how could one day People, your neighbor, ordinary people wake up and kill people just like that. How? How is it possible? In fact, most of the Rwandese I, I, I know, they said nobody thought it was possible. Yunamir was right there, mm. and they, could, they just put away, it's just talk. Nobody thought it was possible that a genocide could happen by ordinary young people with machetes, not by, you know, people see gangs and other things, you know, quite organized gangs, but these were just your neighbors picking up a machete and killing you or throwing you in, the, in a grave alive and you die. Yeah. Or um, uh, you run to a church and before churches were places of refuge, yeah. suddenly it was no longer a place of refuge. How do you reach a point when you think it is okay to kill somebody else and there has to be propaganda? around that. You, there has to be something that you do not feel you're killing a fellow human being. You're killing a snake, which is what they called the Tutsis. And we hear that and even amongst ourselves, where you say some of these people are like snakes, these people are like this. Anyway, you're killing a snake. They call them Inyenzi. What should you do with an Inyenzi? We, we, it, it, you know, it's a Bantu language, so uh, Inyenzi is like a cockroach, isn't it? What do you do with an Inyenzi? What, is, what, is, what are you supposed to do? Exterminate it. And for days on end, young men were running on the streets singing, we shall exterminate them. Yeah, we shall like, exterminate the Inyenzi. 
But, you know, people were sitting back saying, it's not possible. And um, when we were young, we had a term that people would say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Yeah. It never happens like that. Words are so powerful. The difference between this particular genocide, and I must say beforehand, even the Tutsis, had, they, they used to be killings of Tutsis from 1959. Mm. Why was this so effective? Yeah. The power of the pen. The pen is mightier than the sword. And in this place, I say the pen, because it was a newspaper, the word that you use is mightier than a sword. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's the shortest one now. I'm told we are running out of time. Um, so I'll start with you, Dr. Fred, in under half a minute. Just in closing, we have young people in this room, and I want to hear your thoughts or your message to them. Because the 1994 genocide against the Tutsis was stopped by the then young um, uh, people in, 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 in that state, President Kagame and his peers. I hear a lot of young people who probably sometimes would say, if they were born in 1994, today they are 30 years. And they did not waste witness firsthand. So sometimes some of them, that memory is sort of faded. How do we ensure that young people continue this memory and these conversations of national unity and maintain the strides that we've seen? I think that's a question I'll ask all of you. And what do you see in the next 30 years for Rwanda in your closing remarks, starting with you, Dr. Fred? Thank you very much. I think what we are doing here is part of what we should be doing. And as I said, I'm going back to Rwanda tonight. This entire week is going to be dedicated to conversations within communities at the national level. These things happen all the time. But again, guess what? There are people who say, we've had enough of these commemorations. And sometimes it's actually not Rwandans. It's again outsiders looking into Rwanda and saying, yeah, when is this going to stop? But in my opinion, conversations like the one we've just, we are having here, these conversations are happening in Rwanda, they're happening all over the world uh, where Rwanda has embassies. Uh, at some point, I'm going to travel to another country where I'm, I've been invited again to engage in this kind of conversation. I think we shouldn't stop, we should continue. And as people from Kenya have been saying, other countries can pick up from this and make sure that we don't create conditions that lead our countries to disaster of the kind that we saw in 1994 in Rwanda. Thanks. Thank you, Prof. The message we must learn is one, that if we stop conversations such as these, then we create a fertile ground for conflict. We must continue in conversation. Those who are in positions of decision making, we must continue to teach this because it is by reminding ourselves of the dangers that we face that we avoid the landmines in our paths. And I think it is critical that we have these conversations going forward. Let it be taught in schools and let us borrow from the wisdom of old that we must never forget, but we must be quick to forgive. If we do that, then we know that what has happened before can happen. That is why eternal vigilance is critical. 30 years in the life of any nation is a very short time. And let us never ever imagine that it cannot happen again. If we have that in our mind, we'll do everything possible to avoid. That is how I understand never again. The path to genocide is one, adversarial politics, two, ethnic competition, which leads to ethnic mobilization, three, whether there's a history of genocide ideology in your society, four, incitement to genocide, five, genocide. The extent to which you can control that path is only limited. Once it is outside of ethnic competition, it has left your control and the ability to uh, prevent genocide is almost impossible. Therefore, when you look at your society, which because genocide can happen anywhere, you ask yourself, is there adversarial politics? Is there ethnic mobilization? Is there a history of genocide ideology? So when you look at Rwanda, the history of genocide ideology is what prevents or that is, is the reason ethnic-based Competition is unacceptable because once you accept it, 
you no longer can control the recurrence of genocide. I also want to urge all of us, do not learn about Rwanda just on the media. If you're here in Kenya, it's less than two hours flight to Kigali. And if you're going by bus, it's going to be a very fun road trip, around 24 hours enjoying the, 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 the scenery. Come, visit Rwanda. See it for yourself. Visit the Gisozi Genocide Memorial. Get the inside story for yourself. Be able to understand all these things uh, for yourself. I want to say thank you to the organizers, the High Commission. Let's appreciate the Rwanda High Commission in Rwanda. And all the partners, including yourselves, who've been listening keenly. And at this point, I want to sign off. As always, my name is Eugene Anangwe. Take care of yourselves and see you soon.